Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming out to, I believe it's the first Barack lecture of the season, the academic year, um, in a brand new facility, so thanks to uh, the business school for, uh, for allowing us to use the space. Uh, I also want to thank the president's office, and Susan Davidson in particular. Susan, are you still here? There she is. Uh, highly recommend uh, using the Burak lectures to bring uh, folks like uh, Mark LaBelle, caliber of Mike, Mark LaBelle, to, into town. Um, very, very helpful, and uh, we're thrilled. Also, uh, a set of thank yous to my co-conspirators in, in bringing Mark here, uh, Asim Zia, uh, over in Community Development and Applied Economics, and Meredith Niles in the Nutrition and Food Science Program. Um, they've both been really, really helpful in helping to craft uh, Mark's visit. Um, and Meredith and Mark have a, go way back uh, at UC, UC Davis, and it's been great to uh, rekindle those connections. Um, also thanks to uh, the Gund Institute uh, for co-sponsoring this, uh, to my own home department of community development and applied economics, uh, to the Office of Vice President for Research, uh, who's uh, very much supportive of water, water research, um, and all the colleagues who have met with Mark um, over the last two days and those who are going to mix and mingle with him uh, later, later tonight. So following Mark's talk, we will be having a reception uh, just out immediately to outside the doors here. We invite you to stay around. There will be some question and answer period, so please also stick around for that and feel free to um, come, with, come with your questions. So today's speaker is, is a real leader in the field of, of water governance, water governance research. Um, we all know with the specter of climate change and political conflicts, um, increasing resource scarcity, um, conflict over water, water use, water quality, water quantity um, are ever present, um, are an ever present challenge and will only likely continue to do so. So how are we gonna govern our way through these challenges as we face the changing dynamics of the changing climate uh, and, and ever evolving political systems? Uh, he's currently a professor and vice chair of the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of California, Davis. He's also the director of the Center for Environmental Policy and Behavior and possesses his PhD in political science from, from SUNY uh, Stony Brook. So he's, he's, he's East Coast trained. So it's a credit for him. Um, Mark, uh, even though he looks like a young guy, he's prolific. Uh, he's authored or co-authored over 90 articles in peer-reviewed journals. Um, his work has appeared in such high-caliber journals as Ecology and Society, Journal of Environmental Management, Public Administration Review, Environment and Behavior, Water, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Global Environmental Change, Plus One, Society and Natural Resources, and the list does go on. Uh, his research has been funded by the National Science Foundation through many grants, as well as the USDA, uh, as well as the state of California. So a lot of Mark's work, as he's going to talk about today, is done in partnership uh, with collaborators, with stakeholders. So it's, it's a real action agenda. Uh, as you assume many national leadership roles, advancing policy network and environmental management topics within the field of public, political science. And he's real, I would say, he's, I would argue he's probably the foremost uh, environmental, next to Bob Bartman. Uh, environmental policy, well, particularly in water, in the, in the political science field. Um, he sits on the editorial boards of such journals as Society and Natural Resources, Public Administration and Review, Behavioral Science and Policy, and the International Journal of Water Governance. And you're going to see all of those threads in today's talk. He teaches courses regularly on some top topics of obviously politics and and uh, policy, land land use management, public lands management and also is developing courses in social ecological systems. And that's another area where Mark is at the vanguard of. He's helping us think about how to, how to analyze and model um, social ecological systems. His own words, Mark's work, as you'll hear, is about cooperation. Um, it's the study of cooperation problems and decision making in environmental, agriculture, and public policy. Um, we're all, many of us are probably likely familiar with the tragedy of commons issues that um, I think drives a lot of Mark's work. He view, views these cooperation problems um, as the causes of many, many environmental pro, uh, conflicts. Uh, one of the largest areas of Mark's contributions has been the area of theory advancement in the concept of ecology of games, as well as the idea of integrated water resource management. These are two 
keystone theoretical frames that really guide water governance as well as environmental governance in general. Um, and his breadth in where he applies his empirical research extends to uh, flood hazard mitigation, plant disease, transportation behavior, invasive species, um, among others. Uh, methodologically, uh, Mark is one of the leading uh, users and employers of social network analysis, a lot of which you're going to hear about today as it applies to water governance. So in addition to all that, Mark is a renaissance man. He plays a mean guitar, I'm told. Uh, he's, he's, been a blue, he's been in bluegrass, but, he, but he's phased out of that because it's not, it's not electric. So he's in a, he's in a funk band uh, called Funk, funk, funk Funkified. Well, actually, it's changed It's now. changed. Yeah. It's an evolving <laughs> band. But uh, if you're around the Bay Area, look him up that way. Uh, I can also vouch for he's an avid fisherman, outdoorsman, soccer player, probably a swell dad too, I'm sure. Um, and just <laughs> thank Mark for taking the time out and uh, engaging us in this, in this talk. So without further ado, Mark LeBeau. That's a very kind introduction. Thank you very much. I feel like I should put up the YouTube videos of our band and just let it be, be done with, you know, and we don't you know, have to talk about water governance. Um, but th thanks very much for the invitation. It's been like a very fun visit so far. I've been very impressed with lots of different things that are happening here at University of Vermont. And a very interdisciplinary environment makes me feel like I'm at home at Davis from that, from that perspective. So as um, Chris mentioned, um, I basically focus in my research on the evolution of cooperation and collective and how you solve cooperation problems in the context of environmental governance and water governance uh, is where a lot of my research has been done. And in particular, what I've been working on in the past about about a decade now, I guess the 2013 was where the, the kind of paper that I published that, that laid out the theory of the ecology of gains framework is how cooperation evolves in the context of really complex governance systems where you have lots of different collective action problems, lots of different actors, lots of different policy venues in which decisions are being made. Um, so let me, um, and I've done a lot of my work in California, but you're going to see some comparative work here in, in, in a second. So let me just kind of motivate this with California. This is the San Francisco Bay Area of California and the Delta. Here's the Delta. Here's, the, here's uh, San Francisco Bay itself. Golden Gate Bridge is here. There's nine counties in this Bay Area um, that, that, that we, I've done a lot of work on. And this is so just the map of it. This program here is called Integrated Regional Water Management, which has been one of California's uh, flagship programs for trying to get actors to cooperate together in the context of water management in the Bay Area. Okay, this is the San Francisco Bay Joint Venture, another partnership, this one uh, spearheaded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about how to get uh, waterfowl habitat back in place and, uh, and restored on the Pacific Flyway because California has lost 90% of its wetlands, the Bay Area and it was, it was a big part of that, so um, these little dots here are, are different project areas for that. This is another one called the Baylands Ecosystem Habitat Goals Project that tries to figure out what are the different kind of wetlands and coastal areas and how to restore them and what, they, what values they represent. This is at a smaller scale, the Sonoma Creek TMDL. TMDL, you guys know that well because there's a big, big fight about those at Lake Champlain, Total Maximum Daily Load Program. This one's for sediment um, in so Sonoma Creek, which feeds into the bay, and, and it's yet another program that's trying to get stakeholders to work together to solve an environmental problem. Um, Alameda County Art Project. This is a more recent one that focuses on adapting to rising tides. That's what art stands for, and how to deal with impending sea level rise and coastal flooding that's already happening. The infrastructure to put in place, what are the vulnerabilities, how do you deal with disadvantaged communities, and that sort of thing. This is the South Bay Pond Restoration Project, which is um, mostly U.S. F Fish and Wildlife Service project because there's some national wildlife refuges down here. And these were salt ponds that during the gold rush were used to mine salt. And they, as you can imagine, they are pretty much destroyed the wetlands there, and you're trying to restore those. So what is that? That's uh, six different collaborative partnerships, all in one geography at different scales. So in one of, one of the studies that I did, um, which I'll show you some of the results of, I went out and found as many stakeholders in the San Francisco Bay as I could and asked, who are involved with water management, I asked them uh, to identify the 
core projects slash policy venues that they were involved with. They could name up to three. So I had about 300 stakeholders answer this. They named things like Sonoma Creek TMDL, IRWM, and stuff like that. How many total water management policy venues do you think I discovered through that process? There's six here. How many total do you think I discovered? This is an audience participation part. It's kind of like Jeopardy or something like that. You don't have to answer it in the form of a question, though. So what, how many total projects do you think I discovered? 70? Higher. 100? Lower. 120-ish, yeah. Right. Over 100 different projects at different scales in which people are collectively getting together to try to understand, to try to deal with water management. Most of policy analysis, up, in my view, up to this point, basically would take one of these things and say, how effective is this TMDL? How effective is this project or that project in cooperation? The whole point of my research in the ecology of games framework and really what I've been studying at this level has been to uh, how to understand how that system operates, how the cooperation and learning and distribution and fairness works across that entire system. So if, I leave, if, if you leave right now from this talk, and you leave with the point that we need to be studying the entire system and its, and its structure and function and dynamics over time, I will feel I have succeeded in delivering the message here. Because that is, to me, like the, um, the, the, the major challenge of, of what we need to be studying and researching and communicating with stakeholders around water governance. Because when you go out in the real world and look at these systems, they all look like this. You will not find, in my opinion, if, if you do find a system which has like only one policy venue in, in it at a place in a region, come tell me because I'd like to know about it. Every, if you start thinking about this in this way, wherever you go, you are going to start seeing systems like this and be, hopefully be convinced you should be studying them in this way because I'll tell you, I'm going to do a little bit more on telling you about the structure and function of these systems, but we need a heck of a lot more research to understand what is going on. Okay, so that's really the reality, right? The reality of these systems is that they're messy, they're polycentric, they're fragmented, they're complex adaptive systems, they, they, they're multi-levels with cross-scale interactions, they have all these multiple actors and institutions. This policymakers realize this. This is a quote from Phil Eisenberg, one of the leading uh, former mayor of Sacramento, chair of the Delta Stewardship Council, one of the leading water policy practitioners in the history of California and one of the most interesting ones in my opinion. This is his response to one of our papers in Public Administration Review. Public policy is always a mess. It's acknowledging inevitable in how to figure out how to manage a messy situation. We, the, they are always messy. Democracy creates messes of this sort and we need to figure out how to manage them. And then this is Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, in her Nobel Prize address from the theoretical perspective to explain the world of interactions and outcomes occurring at multiple levels. We have to be willing to deal with complexity instead of rejecting it. That's what I'm trying to do here. So I kind of view Ostrom throwing down the theoretical gauntlet here and this type of work trying to pick that up and carrying it forward to deal jointly with the practical and the theoretical issues there. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is from the 2013 framework that says the Ecology of Games framework that's the theoretical framework that I, that I it's kind of a, evolved from an old sociologist uh, paper, a guy named Norton Long, who talked about it in the context of urban. So I did not coin this term, but I kind of updated the framework by integrating it with some other things. And it talks about how multiple actors might be involved with uh, different policy institutions. So this would be like a TMDL or, or a IRWM or whatever it is that you're looking at, you're like the Lake Champlain TMDL, and then multiple collective action problems. This could be water supply, water quality, invasive species, um, and how they're all linked together. And so you can read the paper to get into depth about how this is all put together. This is kind of the, a conceptual framework. Within these uh, systems, I think there's three core processes that we need to be paying attention to. And I would submit to you that I, what, what I like about this is only three. I don't, I don't want to deal with a whole bunch of things. I want to deal with three. I think this is in any complex governance system, possibly complex societies. These are the three key ones. How, how people learn um, about what are the nature of the problems, what are the nature of the solutions, and importantly, from a political perspective, what are the preferences of the other actors involved? What are they doing? Then how do you cooperate with each other, both at the policy level, coming to agreement about different policies and how to implement them at the resource use level, about how to 
uh, you know, use resources without and avoid the tragedy of the commons. And then another one that's really important is distributional procedural, distributional fairness and procedural fairness, thinking about the equity of those outcomes. Because in any society where you have to think about the use of resources, if you don't have some fair use of resources or equity, some notion of equity driving that, eventually that society is likely to run into some serious problems. And this is, all, this is where a lot of the political power and bargaining aspect uh, is, is happening, which has is, which is long been a criticism of Ostrom's framework of, of not being able to effectively deal with that. I think that's where it comes in here. All right, so now I'm going to report the results of some studies um, and a few of the core hypotheses that we've focused on. And, just the, and, and we've done it comparatively in a number of different systems. So this is the San Francisco Bay, and I've basically spearheaded those with some surveys of stakeholders in 2012, 2014. Um, the same survey was rolled out in Tampa Bay, Florida in two years, and the Paraná River Estuary in Argentina, Uruguay. This is Ramiro Barrado at Ohio State. This is my old advisor. Uh, John Schultz, who made me study taxes at first, and I said the environment's cooler, and he studied the environment ever after. And this is Jack, Jack Muherter, um, who's at uh, uh, University of Ohio, Cincinnati, or University of Cincinnati. Uh, I always forget the name of that one, sorry, Jack. <laughs> and then um, this is Matt Hamilton, a former PhD student. He took the framework and the survey and adapted it to the context of climate adaptation in Lake Victoria. Um, in Africa. So I'm going to show you results from all of those different comparative sites. And in case you didn't think that this is an exportable framework, right, it's not just about um, water governance, it's about any sort of complex policy system where there's complex institutional arrangements. So my favorite and most exotic, in a sense, extension of the system has been the application to the Norwegian handball talent development. So you see the ecology of games, a case study of Norwegian handball which might be more fun than water governance, I don't know. It looks kind of difficult. And, and so, and th this is the, from their app, there's a need for well-developed coordination mechanisms. So the same things are happening in such diverse locations. Water governance, education, health, climate change, Norwegian handball, food systems. You'll find this issue in all of them. We need to be studying. So here's all the hypotheses. Um, that I'll be trying to get through. Um, complex policy systems have structures for cooperation and learning from a network perspective. I'll get to that. Um, how they change in response to new problems. The dynamics depends on their capacity and the sorts of constraints that they have on central versus decentralized authority. Um, there's this idea of institutional externalities, which is like if you make a decision in one institution, it may have a positive or negative effect on your capacity to get things done in another one. Um, institutions co-evolve with cooperation, so we show that um, if two actors participate in the same policy forum, they are also likely to cooperate, but it depends on the nature of the forum, the scale at which it operates. And then on the performance of the system, um, there's different variables that are linked to that that have kind of a what, what a transaction cost perspective, which is the, the idea of transaction cost is that when you're cooperating, you have to overcome the costs of, of discovering the solutions that you might cooperate on, bargaining over the distribution of the benefits and costs, and then monitoring and enforcing the resulting agreements. Okay, so let's start with the first one about the structure. I, get, I want to get I have to get to this. I have to get a little a little little bit of a detour into policy network analysis. So in policy network analysis, um, you might, uh, is network analysis is basically about nodes and links. So you have some actors or different types of, of entities which are linked via some social relationship. So if I was dealing with a, what's called a one mode network, I'd like ask everybody in this room uh, who collaborates with who or who sends money to who and we'd have an actor to actor network. But I also, you can also study what are called bipartite networks which, or, or two-mode networks, which is what we're studying here, where you have actors. These could be policy actors. All the state agencies, local governments, NGOs, whatever, participating in one of all those 120-so policy institutions that I found. And then in what, what one of the classic approaches to network analysis is to say, within these networks, as we measure them, you're going to look for structural configurations that are the fingerprint of some type of social process. 
And one of the really common ones is that you have so-called closed network structures, which are here, two actors participating in the same institution. So this would be like me and Chris going to lots of the same conferences together. And if we go to the lots of the same conferences together, we're likely to form a bond with each other. And if Chris behaves really badly at a conference, I can see it and tell other people. So there's like a, or if he behaves well, you know, then I can, there's a reputation management thing that can go on and monitoring that could go on to help people cooperate. And then these are more open network structures where you have actors participating um, in, uh, lots of actors participating in a single institution or lots of institutions singled around one actor, and that's like a coordination point. So they're open, there's not a lot of non-redundant information happening there, and that's for efficient transmission of information is the theory. So um, the, there's hypotheses that would say this is like bonding social capital, bonding for cooperation, bridging for information sharing, and, and these network structures, these different types of network structures, when you see them in the network, are consistent with, they're like the fingerprints of those sorts of social processes. Uh, we can talk about in the Q&A wh whether you believe that, but, th but that's the logic of a lot of the network analysis that's, that's happening in policy, policy analysis right now. Okay, so this is the actual, from the first study that we did, that, that I did, in the first paper we wrote about this, this is from the Bay Area around uh, integrated regional water management. And all of these um, uh, red circles are actors of various sorts, and the blue squares are the policy venues in which they participate. For example, I started with the list of integrated regional water management, which at the time was the big, the big story there. And that's like the, w where the biggest game is. So all the lines are actors participating in these games. So this is a two-mode network. And this is where that came up. This number is like 100 and something in here. And you can see this is what governance looks like. It's not pretty. It's messy. And so, but within this are those little motifs to think about what are the structural configurations. This is um, a, z a zooming in on the most central actors, and you can see this is that big square, Bay, Bay Area IRWM, and there's several other ones, East Bay Water Forum, Central Valley Flood Plan, CalFed, which at the time was still alive, and then all these big actors here. A lot of these actors here are government agencies, state and federal government agencies, and some regional government agencies that span a, a, a broad geography, just to give you a sense of who's, who's in there. Okay, so ignore everything for the most part here except where these circles are, but this, I, I want to show, you know, the um, uh, canonical regression table here. These are the results of what's called an exponential random graph model. The exponential random graph models are, are, are the cross-sectional models that are, in a sense, the regression analysis for networks. And what they do is they say, they take the network structure and think about which, given a, a link, does the link produce uh, particular uh, structural patterns that make it more or less likely to observe the network? So you basically say to yourself, how likely is it to observe different structural motifs? You put those motifs in here as independent variables in a sense. And the coefficients tell you if it's a positive coefficient, you're likely to see more uh, a link that is that creates these motifs is more likely to exist. And if it's a negative uh, coefficient, a link that creates that motif is less likely to exist. So this is basically showing you here that there's a lot of, in the Bay Area, there's a lot of centralization along, among institutions, um, where you have like big, those big blue squares that are centralizing a lot of actors and providing bridging capital. And this one, there's a lot of actors within the same geography. So they, they operate in the same county in the Bay Area working together. And then these are showing that, uh, larger, that, that more actors that are state government, federal government, or water, water or environmental special districts are, are more densely connected in the network. So they have, they're, they're more powerful within the network in a sense. And then down here, the mo there, there's some convergence issues in these sort of models so you can analyze what's left over. And what's left over is there's also a lot of closed network structures. So the, 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 the overall network actually has uh, motifs that are related both to learning and cooperation, both bridging and, and bonding social capital exist in these networks, and that's crucial. It's, these networks are not built from one purpose. They're multi-purpose networks that have to deal with all of those problems. Okay, so then we can think comparatively what's happening. So this is a paper in Public Administration Review where we looked at the networks 
in the Paraná River, Tampa Bay, in Sacramento, San Joaquin River. And again, we see a lot of uh, uh, open network structures around um, forums, individual uh, policy, uh, po policy venues, like down here in San Francisco Bay in the Delta. But in Tampa Bay, you have a, more around the actors. And in particular, there's a really strong type of actor in Florida called the Southwest Florida Water Management District, which integrates a lot of the different types of water policy decisions. So depending on the overall institutional structure in a particular state, you get the networks to, to, to uh, have different types of structures. And this is you know, the comparative. And also, you notice the Paraná is much smaller. So there already gives you a hint that in the developing country context, the institutional capacity for developing these sorts of, of arrangements could be smaller. OK, so how do they change in response? This is Ramiro's work from Paraná. Um, so he did the, the, the network in 2010, 2012. And during, in right, right before he did it here, there was a big uh, wildfire event in Paraná. This is a picture of the smoke from the satellite. And as a consequence of that, uh, the, 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 the network responded by creating a bunch of new forums and getting a lot more participation. But what Muriel showed over time is when he did it again, a lot of that stuff had disappeared. So that gives us a hint that, well, number one, dynamics are crucial, but it's also not a guarantee that something that the institutions are built and then they stay. And the, 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 the uh, hypothesis that Ramiro is working on here is that um, because of the lack of capacity in a lot of developing countries, this is like a key characteristic. They get together, they respond to an event, they talk, they come up with some informal ideas and maybe some plans, and then nothing really happens because they don't have the capacity to keep that institutional development going. Okay, then you can look at, as a comparison, what's happening with sea level rise in, um, in San Francisco Bay. And I just want to point out that adaptation to sea level rise also has a lot of cooperation problems involved. It's not just mitigation where collective action has to happen with climate change. But for example, this is with my engineering colleague Mark Stacy out of Berkeley. If you knock out Berkeley with flooding, look at all the regional transportation impacts that happen. People have to move all around, so you get these big regional interdependencies. And then if you protect Alameda County, like do a, do a, a shoreline scenario where you just armor Alameda County and say no flooding is going to occur there, it moves water elsewhere. So it actually is like a bathtub type of effect where protecting, doing, doing inf infrastructure protection in one county actually creates regional effects. And that, given those interdependencies, you have to find cooperation. So this is what's happened in our more, our more recent analysis in the Bay Area. This was, this, these statistics were derived from looking, or these networks were measured looking at uh, uh, different planning documents. And you can see in, in, in when those planning documents were created. And you can see time one, there's a very few things that are looking at sea level rise. But over time, this network just grew and grew and grew. And you have more and more projects, more and more actors involved with looking at sea level rise and, and, and climate adaptation in the Bay Area. And this is what the, kind of the vintage. You know, it's from California, so we got to think about the vintage of things. So, um, so the first one was born around 1992. But then they, around 2010, the rate at which these new institutions were created to deal with sea level rise really accelerated. And it's, and it's still happening. Like you're just seeing this ex like a Cambrian explosion of institutional development that's happening right now in the Bay Area around sea level rise. I mean, I'm deeply involved with talking to people about what is this going to look like. They're trying to figure it out right now. So you, you're at a moment of institutional change, which makes sea level rise a cool thing to study. But also what hap what's happening there is th these connections right here are, are the, the presence of different connections local actors to local venues. So for example, a city connecting to another city operating at the local level, or a local actor connecting to a regional venue, or a regional actor connecting to a local venue, or a regional actor to a regional venue. And what you see is that the, it's a process of decentralization, not centralization. So, so to actually address a regional problem, What's happening is you're getting a lot more regional actors going to local venues, like saying, hey, sea level rise is a problem. We're going to create like a local vulnerability planning process and help you with it. 
and local actors cooperating with each other. And there's not very much region to region stuff. The, 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 the relative importance of region to region and, and local going up to the regional decreases. So it looks in California, which has a very strong home rule tradition of local governments trying to maintain their autonomy, the only way to make region happen is to go local is to decentralize it. Now, we don't know if that's the same thing that would happen in Vermont or whatever, which talks about the comparative studies, but that's what it's looking like in California as far as the dynamics go for sea level rise. OK, it, next hypothesis, institutional externalities and political power of actors. So we try to figure out how do these institutions affect each other. So we would ask in one of our surveys, this is 2014 version of our surveys, we said to people, name the primary most important thing that you're involved with. And a lot of people might uh, do this in California, may say CalFed, which was one of the big partnerships at the time. And then we would say, out of a list of other ones, how much does um, influence do these other ones have on yours? So they say, well, I'm in CalFed. And I'm, doing, I'm either doing well or doing not well in um, CalFed. But now does IRWM, another forum, does that influence positively or negatively what I'm doing in CalFed? Or in the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan, yeah, I participate in that or not. Does it have a positive or negative influence? Or the Bay Area IR, IR, IWRM, does that have a positive or negative influence? And you add all that up. And when you get that across all the respondents, these are all the arrows here show interdependencies between institutions. In other words, um, the, the overall strength of a decision being made in one institution affecting the other institutions. So the question in this analysis was, given those interdependencies, how well are, able, are people able to achieve their goals? Because you go to these uh, policy actors go to try to like, achieve their goals. How well are they doing that? And then what we were able to show is that when the externalities are really strong and people are, um, but, they, but they will also say that I'm doing well in another institution. This, this would be like, say, Chris is saying, I participate in the University of Vermont, um, but I'm also participating in some other thing and I'm doing really well. That, that other thing will not, uh, will not have much of an effect on how well Chris does at the University of Vermont, but if he says, that he's doing poorly in those other places, that has a really negative effect on your capacity to get things done. So the, the kind of a, one of the interesting policy lessons from that is like, if you want to succeed in winning in one policy game, like the big policy game, go to other policy, even smaller games that are linked and win. And if you do that, you can kind of mitigate the effect. So you need to have a portfolio of participation, which I would say is also, if you want to change something in you know, the administration of a university, you better participate in multiple games to figure out how to do it and win a few of the small ones, and then you can win the big ones. OK, so that's institution X. Now, the next one is how do institutions co-evolve with cooperation? And the, the question here is that, and this was a long, for a long time, we didn't really know if joint participation in one of these policy forms would actually lead them to collaborate here. So we tried to figure out, OK, does this actually happen, that you will develop bilateral collaboration as a function of institution? This is like a huge core hypothesis in the entire institutional literature, is that institutions can at least co-evolve with participation if not produce co uh, uh, with cooperation if not produce cooperation so does this link exist if they both joint if these two actors jointly participate here and the but we argue in the paper that um, th it depends at geographic on geographic scale so if in this is from the Lake Victoria if, if it's working at the Lake Victoria regional level it's less likely to evolve cooperation than they're, they're working at the national level. Or if they're trying to make a, a, um, a very large policy change, like at the level of major rules governing decision making, it's harder than if they're trying to deal with implementation of projects. And what this shows here is from the network modeling we did in there is the probability that this link exists based on whether or not the two actors participate jointly in a forum. So the first question is, yeah, if they jointly participate in the forum, they're more likely to cooperate. But the likelihood of that goes down as you go from the national, subnational level scale within a country in Lake Victoria to the regional, to the Africa continent, to the global scale. So it gets much harder 
at higher levels of geographic scale. And if you're dealing with what we classify as more kind of operational choice, those, that would be an Ostrom term versus collective choice, that as you go up the levels, and this is a core hypothesis in the whole Ostrom framework, as you go up from operational rules to collective choice to constitutional, um, those of you who know Ostrom's work will know this language, it gets harder, and we show that exactly, that exact thing in this paper. This is, Matt Hamilton made up this, made up this graph, by the way. Kudos to Matt Hamilton for like my favorite graph. I hope you like it too. Uh, okay, now finally, the how do these institutions perform? Um, we looked at, um, to, to measure performance, I, I mean, obviously, you're going to ask the question, and everybody does, you know, how, how, does, this, how does this affect uh, environmental outcomes? I'm not going to be able to answer that question right now, because we need a heck of a lot more research. But as a proxy, to start out with, we can say, how do well do people perceive the performance of the institutions in terms of having an impact on your, your interests, if they're fair, if they improve, if they think they improve the problem if you had some efficacy in it. So for each, and in, in many of our studies, we say, which ones do you participate in? Like this would be you know, policy actor X participating in the Central Valley protection, flood protection uh, plan and their views on how effective that thing was. So, so you can imagine in a survey design, that's kind of, it's a tricky business because you might have people nominate 10 different things that they participate in. And then for each one of them, we had them say, how effective were they? And then, and then we're able to analyze that. So our, our kind of hypotheses are based from transaction cost theory, saying the performance of these institutions depends on the payoffs that people see, cooperative or conflict, how much scientific knowledge is at play, how much they understand the preferences of other people, their level of participation, how experienced they are in water, and whether or not they are a government actor. And so this basically shows the, the, um, the marginal effect of all those independent variables uh, depending on um, that. So you do a regression analysis and say, how much do, does each of these, I'm focused just on two, how much do each of these uh, independent variables, political knowledge and scientific knowledge, affect performance across these different systems, Tampa, California, Paraná, for all these different things. So for example, if you see, if you see here, this is people that say, I really understand um, political knowledge. Um, I understand the preferences of other actors really well. That has a fairly negative effect on how the, the, the contribution to the problem, but it has a really strong effect on how well they perceive the fairness and efficacy of the, of the thing. So it's kind of like you're going in, you're talking to people, and as soon as you understand their preferences, the perce your perceptions of the procedural fairness get better. And it's really strong for Paraná and not as strong for California and Tampa. So it's like Paraná is an early, earlier stage of institutional development. So the, the hypothesis there is that at an earlier stage of institutional change, this political knowledge and procedural bit is the most important. Because that's the thing that is affecting people's pr performance the most. But as you go into more mature systems, um, scientific knowledge plays a much larger role on, and, and has a broader role across different performance. So it has, it has an impact on fairness and efficacy, and also on the more kind of output, outcome-oriented perceptions. Does it solve the problem? Does it help me achieve my interest? And especially in California and Tampa Bay, the more mature systems. So the, 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 the relationship between these transaction cost variables and the outcome and performance of the system depends not only on the, the type of, per, the, the, the um, dependent variable or, or output, uh, performance metric you're looking at, but depends on something about the stage of institutional development, possibly something about the level of the political development in a country. With the idea that the, uh, we, we think as far as um, developing, when you're creating new institutions, paying attention to the policy preferences and that type of political knowledge is the first step. And later the science part comes in, which is counterintuitive to a lot of people because a lot of people are like, oh, to solve policy problems we have to get the best available science in place, which is true, but probably before that you got to understand what the preferences are of the actors that are involved with these processes. Because if you don't get that right, then you're never going to be able to figure out uh, how to find a solution set. And this is just fresh fresh from the airplane editing that I was doing on the way over here. 
This is in Lake Victoria where we asked them similar questions. And um, so how, how good is the information available to you? How would you describe the cooperation between organizations? Is it fair for all the venues? And the different measures of social capital, either um, closure and or bridging. And what it shows here, like for example, these, this bridging tie, people who participate in a lot of, in, in, in forums that are very popular, in other words, have lots of participants, they get more information, but they, it has a negative effect on cooperation and fairness. While the collaborative closure, as expected, has a positive effect on cooperation and, and no effect on information and procedural fairness, which means that two types of social, social capital, bridging and bonding social capital, have differential trade-off effects on the different types of performance. So if you're building one of these systems or thinking about managing the systems, you need to have both information sharing and cooperation and fairness as, as performance criteria that you want to meet. But there's going to be trade-offs there. And how you manage those trade-offs is going to be a key to the effectiveness of the system, especially if you have to think about the system over time that at one stage learning needs to be emphasized and in other stages you might have to deal with cooperation more significantly. So this is a cool paper in my opinion too. All right, so here's the recap of all the hypotheses. Um, you know, we, we think that they, they have structures, cooperation, and learning, um, that the institutional change over time is crucial, but it depends on the capacity and the type of political culture. Institu institutional externalities, not only do they exist, but they constrain how actors perform and makes it so that the actors have to have a deal with a portfolio of policy participation. I think we've got now strong evidence from our work and also some others' works have done it that institutions and cooperation do indeed co-evolve. Which comes first is still an open question, but I think they co-evolve for sure. And that the performance of these institutions is affected by variables that are related to transaction costs, such as political knowledge and scientific knowledge. But the dynamics of that, again, varies across space and time. So where does that lead us to the future? Yeah, you, know, you guys said you wanted to, about the future of water governance. Well, I'm not exactly, you know, who's Johnny Carson prognosticator guy? What's, what was it called? What's that? Carmack, yeah, this probably, I should have asked, you know, all of the 20-somethings in here if they could have said that. But, <laughs> but anyways, it's, uh, um, what I view, I mean, for sure, um, it's messy. And it's gonna, it's messy now, it's gonna be messy later, and we need to learn how to steer it. So what I view from the research perspective is what this perspective has done is kind of opened a Pandora's box to think about, to, to try to get as many people as I can to study policy systems from this perspective and build on what we've done here. If you want our surveys, you can have them. Please use our surveys, adapt them to your systems, because if we don't get some cumulative knowledge here, we're never going to answer these other big questions. Like, we did some comparative research in other, in other systems, but guess what? There's a lot of countries, a lot of estuaries, a lot, uh, uh, a lot of social ecological systems. There's food systems, there's health policy, there's education system. How do these, how do these complex policy systems work in there? What, what are the things that are, we're always going to see across the systems and over time? And what are the things that are going to vary according to the institutional context or the ecological context? We do not know the answer to any of those questions yet in my, in my, in, in my opinion. And then over time, right, are you getting cycles, shocks? How are things evolving? Is, are these systems that change incrementally? I think they're, they, they're probably subject to punctuated equilibria of various sorts, because that's how most complex system behavior works. Um, how are we going to see that? Um, a lot of my research and other research is focused on cooperation specifically, which obviously is important. But um, I would argue these systems have to have learning and fairness and cooperation are the three core functions. And they do not always um, work in positively with each other. There can be trade-offs with those things. And how do those trade-offs play out? And how do we effectively manage those trade-offs? And how do we steer the system so that those trade-offs are made in the best way over time to have for a society to deal with new problems? And environmental outcomes. All right, so I had the performance thing, but I didn't show you anything about the water quality in, in the California Delta or the health of the Delta smelt or if there's harmful algae blooms in there or not, because all those problems, of course, are linked to each other. But um, I've got one snapshot. 
and it's not only do, do those problems unfold over very long periods of time, which makes it necessary that to track the performance of these systems, we have to be doing long-term research. Like, one of my goals is to establish a net, an observatory network of social ecological systems that are capable of studying this on a scale of 20, 30, 40, 50 years time. So how do we solve the research or collective action problem of doing that? I would, I would invite everybody to cooperate together to do that. Because if we don't do something like that, we're not going to be able to answer questions like this. Um, so not only do the environmental outcomes unfold over very long periods of time, the counterfactual analysis is very difficult to do, to think, OK, if I took out one node from that system, what's going to happen to the environment? Take the delta. How do I do a counterfactual analysis over a 50-year period of the governance system in the delta? What am I going to do? Go back in time for 50 years, take, like remove what node, or remove what half of the governance system, and then see how things are going to unfold. Very difficult to do, but that's the reality. And you know, you, I mean, we, there's a lot of cool work going on with you know, randomized control trials and, and counterfactual analysis and that stuff, but it's very small scale compared to what actually the scale of governance arrangements are in the re reality, in my opinion. And then policy recommendations. Okay, what do we tell policymakers? I said a few things I think that are policy relevant that might be recommendations for either individual actors to help them succeed or that we ought to manage this or that, but. Um, Right now, I'm still struggling, and I'd love to hear any ideas. What are the top five things I'm going to go tell the, um, you know, the governor or the, or the um, chair of the Delta Stewardship Council about how to effectively manage the system? Because what I usually do, if you, go, if you go sit around offices in California right now, you will find pictures from my research sitting on coffee table, various things in, in agency places. And when I have a chat with with agency people or in whatever form, over informally over beers or formally in a workshop or whatever, I, we're looking at these networks and they're like, oh yeah, that's our world. We definitely recognize that. They all recognize it. They're, yeah, it's messy. It sucks to have to go to all these meetings and try to figure out how to do it. There's fragmentation and conflict. And then they say to me, well, what do you do about that? And I'm like, oh man, well, we're trying to figure that out still. You know, I don't have a magic bullet answer for that. I wish I did. But, um, the, I, but I believe that the only way that we will be able to find really good answers about policy recommendations is to embark as researchers on this type of approach where you're looking at these systems over a long period of time. And if we have enough people doing that, of enough places over a long enough time, then I think we're going to get to some more solid answers about how to effectively manage it. All right, so that's it. So thanks very much for listening. I hope I didn't go too fast over some of these things, and I'll take any questions, I guess. Did you want to? Are you going to manage this? or? Yeah. So uh, I think the, the goal is I think we have one mic. So if you could ask your question. Oh, we do have a mic. No? OK. If you could ask your question, then I will restate it for the uh, we'll keep getting video tape. So Sure. Is it online? And when you sure. talk yeah. about the complexity of the networks and the connections between individuals who are sort of key nodes, and they have a lot of connections, and they have to rank a lot of important questions. Yep. What happens with regard to the practicality of surveying those people, not just the first time, but if you're imagining those networks, including to some ephemerality of organization? Yeah. Right. Right. So you go to different places, replicating <laughs> a single methodology, and I'd be fascinating to hear. Fascinating okay, great. To hear your thoughts. 
Excellent question. So what we've done is we've embedded microchips in every single policy actor we can find and track them in real time. No, that's not what we've done, but it'd be really nice to do that and have it like satellite enabled so we can like kind of see it. But th yeah, it's like th I tried that, but it didn't get past the IRB. So, um, so, but yeah, so we do, um, we do a lot of survey research. Most of it is um, on like online via online survey platforms. I think Qualtrics, I've done it in Lime survey. Qualtrics, I think, is a pretty good uh, p uh, platform for that where, and we've done some customization of Qualtrics using their JavaScript interface to be able to like get it to like, you know, be pretty user friendly as far as like, as reduce the respondent burden as much as we can with nominating people so or nominating either people that are that you collaborate with or nominating institutions but there's no doubt uh, an issue with surveys i mean we do not have 100 percent response rate we're ranging somewhere between 35 to 50 percent depending on things so we're so um, you know, network analysis is definitely sensitive to, to, to um, non-response, uh, but I, nevertheless, I think we've learned a lot about what these networks, I kind of think of it as like a, a Monet painting of the networks, like you look at a nice impressionistic Monet painting, you learn something about the landscape, but you don't have like a realist version of it yet, so we're kind of get, we try, try to get there, so yeah, there's, you got to reduce the respondent burden, and then if you can, I mean, on, honestly, if you can, like some of these we did, like by document analysis, we pulled like every single plan that we could find around sea level rise, and then went through the on the document or the website the list of actors and populated it that way, and to make the network. And not only did we populate it that way to make the network, we collected all their contact information at the same time. And there's a survey in the field right now to over 3,000 sea level rise potential sea level rise actors. Um, I think our list we 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 took was too big in the end, but. Um, you got to do stuff like that, and, you, and if you're going to do surveys, just as face it, you're going to have to accept the limitations of response rates here and deal with that as best you can. There's, you know, there's some network methodologies that allow you to estimate the models with missing data on links, but um, you know, that's like not that many links that have missing data that, that I feel those methods are robust to. So those are all, yeah, it's tough. In, in the archival data, uh, using the web or meeting minutes or whatever whatever it is, I think allows you to get more complete network pictures. But the what you observe is limited because all the things on the, the say listed on a document may not capture um, the fact that there's more informal or or not unofficial collaboration going on that that's not observed. So they all have different trade-offs there. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I was really interested in um, your discussion about cooperation and learning being embedded in all complex systems. And I think, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, you were connecting cooperation to bonding social capital and um, the learning to bridging social capital. So but what it sounded like was when you have um, people interacting, let's say you and Chris at a conference, and you go to the same conferences, you're sort of redundant, right? You're seeing the same person which helps to bond you, yes. but perhaps limits your learning. Right. And I'm curious though, because I do, I should say, I do in-depth qualitative research, that actually by doing more um, repetitive interaction, wouldn't you be learning in a more deep sense, rather than a superficial sense? Like, so it's diversity of knowledge rather than depth of knowledge. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I definitely think that, that these open network structures are more about diversity of knowledge and learning new things that you may not have known before rather than like deepening a relationship over time with the idea and you know it's kind of like strong ties weak ties all of this goes back I mean there's a I sh shouldn't say all of it goes back there's just a long tradition in social network analysis about the difference between open and closed network structures and there's like bridging and bonding social capital structural holes strong and weak ties all those different things are, are related but in my opinion, the open network structures are about for novel information rather than deep information. And I guess if I wanted to like um, toe the line of the theory as much as I could, I would say the deep learning you're referring to is really something that enables cooperation more than learning something totally new about a novel policy or something like that. I mean, you could definitely challenge the theory from that perspective, um, but that's like just to keep with, you know, 
in line with what the theory would try to push you to do. That's, that's, that's how I would respond to that. But I do think the systems have to have the novel information bit too, because otherwise you get locked into a pattern of cooperation around one particular, say, solution, and you can't get out of it. And, but, so you have to have a capacity over time. If you can't learn about what are the new problems, how to solve them, what do the new actors want, your system will for sure fail. So you have, and so you have to have both. And then how to manage the, tri and, if, and, if, and if you believe that, which I think there's plenty of evidence for that now, the question becomes how to effectively manage that. And whether or not the closed network structures provide some additional benefits, it could be. It's a paper, a, a hypothesis worth exploring for sure. Other questions? I have so many, I'm not sure where to start. <laughs> but I will say this, that from my experience, Vermont is a beautiful mess, but not nearly as messy as California. Well, that's an interesting statement, because comparatively, what makes one more or less messy is a great question. So um, of the questions I have, I'm going to ask you this one. So organizations sometimes come together organically or self-organize. A group of people will, around a common interest, will create sort of an association, right? If you have, if you're a sort of a central policy actor maker, which a uh, space that I think I occupy, can you use a map like yours to identify and provide guidance as to how to direct the enthusiasm of that group towards an under-occupied space or an under-occupied leverage point? What position are you in? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I, will, I will tell you. I am the senior policy advisor for the state's Department of Environmental Conservation. OK. Man, that's a good question. Um, it's not politically charged. <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, I, I think that one, there's probably two ways to look at that, um, at least two ways to start, or maybe even three. You look at the map and you say, what's going on in the periphery, right? Who are all those actors in the periphery that are not connected to those planning processes, which means they're not very active? And you do an assessment about how important those actors are actually to the environmental problems and the fairness that are, that are there. And if, they, if they are like, they don't matter because they don't care much or they don't have a huge effect, maybe it's okay to leave them out there. But if they do matter because there's a fairness, like an environmental justice consideration, and they're having a huge impact and they're not connected, it's probably a good thing to, to reach out um, and try to get them included. Because if they're not, then whatever your system is doing is likely to, to have a limited impact because you're not changing or, or, or being informed by those, by those actors. Another thing I think to look at is um, uh, like um, thinking about uh, the, uh, if there's a segment of the network, like a set of planning processes that are, don't, are very disconnected, what's going on out there and assessing whether or not that is, it could, it could be like a, a set of planning processes that are mandated by some law or something like that that's acting quite independently of the rest of the system. What's going on out there? Does that need to be linked more? And then another important thing, I think, is how to, in a sense, make the system a little bit more efficient, possibly, because I think what happens in one of the problems, the pathologies of these systems that you'd like to guard against, is uh, having too many redundant forums that are kind of doing a lot of the same things, where people like you have to spend every day going to these forums talking about the same exact thing over and over, and you get a lot of meeting fatigue and process fatigue out of that. And, and how do you reduce that, but not too much? Because you do want some redundancy, but you got to be think about assessing, does each of those blue squares, does it really need to be there? Is it really doing something functional for the system? Or is it just kind of a waste of time? And over time, some of these things do become a waste of time, and stakeholders abandon them, and then they die. That's kind of the birth and death process of, that's happening. These blue squares, they, they live and die according to an evolutionary process where that's basically the selection process is whether stakeholders think they're useful. So I think it's good to be um, uh, explicit about that when you're, when, you're, when you're thinking about systems. So those are kind of three general things that, that, that and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> that would be generalizable to the other environmental issues, or do you think they're all unique? 
you know, say air or water or soil or yeah. food? Um, do you think I think that, some common principles there? Yeah, I think, I think that all of those issues involve collective action and cooperation problems you've got to solve. So I think that the governance systems in, those, in all of those are going to have a lot of common properties. It's kind of a... Uh, uh, educated guess because we haven't really done enough research to get a handle on that. But I think you know, let's say, you know, 80% of the findings from water are going to generalize to what you're seeing in these other systems. But then there's going to be some interesting 20% that's going to be like more specific to types of resources um, that is going to be interesting. We're going to need to have some theory about too because because that that customization to the nature of the problem is part of the is part of the story that's going on here. Not to mention the interconnections between the problems: water, food, energy, da da da. You know, that's what a lot of the, so if I tried to do water, energy, food nexus with this sort of thing and dealt and tried to bring all those things together, it's not going to be um, simple. Any other questions? One over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering. I think that your previous statement about meeting fatigue kind of gets to this. But do, do you ask in your surveys any questions that get at how people, how actors in the network feel about the complexity of the network? You know, because it seems to me like there's probably a sweet spot, and um, you know, from a collective action, collective impact framework would say. Try to all get pointed in the same direction, use the same metrics, you know, set similar goals so that you know you're reducing some of the complexity. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you're insinuating that a certain level of complexity promotes some of the learning and evolution. Yeah, we do have um, in the 2014 version of the survey that went out to Tampa and California. Um, a series of questions that are like, what are the major challenges to cooperation in your system? And like, time, like fragmentation, time fatigue are in there. And I think we replicated that in the sea level rise one that we just let out. I'm just remembering if we got that battery in there. I think we have a version of that in there. Um, so, but we that data is currently, you know, being analyzed right now. Jack is leading the analysis on that. So. Um, I can hopefully report to you what the at least what the rank order is as the key challenges, but definitely we put on like things about there's you don't have enough time or resources to participate across the system, which I expect will be a, a, a pretty high, highly ranked challenge because you kind of at least anecdotally hear it all the time. 